good morning. Welcome to Memorial Baptist Church, this beautiful, sunshiny day. I was being facetious. You can laugh at that. Uh, if we keep getting rains like this, we're going to have to build a boat dock instead of a parking lot, uh, and you all have to come in on your watercrafts of some sort. Uh, we are glad you braved the rains to come in this morning. I uh, laugh about how Baptists don't like to get sprinkled. You know, and if it's okay if we get immersed, but we don't want to be sprinkled, so we kind of hide and shy away from uh, things like that. But glad you braved the weather to be here. And those watching on the internet, we're glad. We hope you're safe and dry where you are, and hope that you enjoy this service. And like, share, make comments uh, about this. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, good, bad, and ugly. We want to hear. Uh, if we're doing a good job or a bad job. We want to hear. So thank you so much for tuning in and watching us. And in the way of announcement, you saw all the things that were uh, happening. We got our community dinner this afternoon at 5 o'clock over in the gymnasium, and it's free. You're all welcome to come. Uh, the idea is we offer this for everybody in our community to come, have a good cooked meal, and get to fellowship with each other and with us. We get to know who our neighbors are, and you get to know a little bit about us. So if you're in the Pulaski area, Come on out at 5 o'clock and enjoy a free, no cost, no obligation meal uh, with us, and it's on us. Um, go Pulaski. Uh, is still registration is still going on for that if you want to be a part of giving back to our community. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, that might be it, all the highlights that I have. All right, well, let's begin with prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this morning, this opportunity we have to worship you. And I pray that through this service, your spirit's going to fall. Here in this building, as well as all over the internet, anywhere where your name is being proclaimed, where your word and truth is being proclaimed, may your spirit fall. May they feel the presence of your holiness and understand our sinfulness. And how we don't deserve to be in your presence. But you make us worthy through the sacrifice of your son Jesus. It's what he did for us that gives us the privilege to be part of your family. To worship together as family. And to honor what you've already done for us. And right now I pray that your spirit would move this morning. And I pray for those that need a healing touch. There are a lot of people on our list that are sick. Uh, they're in pain, whether it's an illness, an injury, or recovering from surgery. They need a healing touch from you right now. And I pray your healing hand would be upon them. We pray for those that are going through the valleys of life, going through those times of darkness, of uncertainty, and it's kind of fearful. Uh, we pray that you would remove the spirit of fear, remind people that you are always present, and help us as a church to walk beside those that we see going into a valley. To encourage them. To let them know they're not alone in their struggles. That there's always someone there to help them. Living the Christ life is not a solo sport. It, we need community and we need each other. We pray for those that have never surrendered to Jesus. And someone may be either here or watching that is in that condition right now. They've never surrendered. And may your spirit speak to them in such a powerful way today that they will surrender their life to you. And so they can find that freedom and joy of being part of your family, forgiven of their f past mistakes and failures, and know that they have a place in eternity with you. Father, may this service honor you and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, stand up. We've got two back-to-back -back awesome hymns that I think you, most of you should know. And uh, I want you to sing out. I want the people on the Internet to hear you.
remain standing. Another good one. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And this was a request just to remind you, if you've got one you haven't sung and you really wish we would, tell me what it is and we'll get it in there. Is it on now? Yep, there we go. All right, we're in Mark's Gospel, Chapter 5, a very powerful uh, event in the life of Jesus, and we'll read verses 1 through 20. I'm reading out of the King, New King James. Uh, it'll be on the screen, but I encourage you to bring a copy of God's Word with you and follow along. It's Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. When he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains he had pulled apart, had, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said. What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you, by God, that you do not torment me. 
for he had said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word, and let's go to him in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I praise you for those that risk their lives to translate it into a language we can understand. And even with, with it being in English, we don't always understand everything we've read. There are still some things that are a mystery to us. There are some things that elude our understanding. We need a teacher. Holy Spirit, come, teach us. Help us to understand these words we just read. What do they mean for us today? How do we apply them to our own lives? And then, how can we teach what we've learned to a new generation that needs to know, needs to understand. Jesus, it's about you. These are your words. This is your story from beginning to end, your redemptive story of how you came to save us from ourselves. So may you be amplified and glorified. May we take these lessons and become more like you through it. You want to shape us into your image. So help us to decrease so that you can increase. This day is a gift from you. What we do in this day becomes a gift we give back to you. So may we live today in such a way that honors the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, it's for you. In your name we pray. Amen. How many of you have watched home improvement shows on TV? I don't care whether, what channels you watch. They marvel me how they can take these dilapidated, barely standing structures and in one hour make them look like the Taj Mahal. Now, I realize that it's weeks. I mean, it, they talk about the timeline, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is. But I always get amazed at how they take these things that... You look at it from the outside, you're like, there's no hope for that house. And at the end of the program, it is like something amazing, the transformation that takes place. Then they had, at some point in time, they used to have home ma or makeovers. Remember makeovers? Where they would take somebody who wasn't always, had all kinds of issues, and they'd give them a makeover. And at the end of the program, they present this new person. There is something in common with all of that, and that is they take something that everybody else would have rejected, said so there's no hope, it's, you know, lost cause, all those things. And people say that about me when I was growing up. I was a hope, hopeless lost cause. And 
it gets transformed into something amazing. But there is a catch. In those homes and in those people that had the externals fixed, unless you fix the internals, it's not going to last. Those, I mean, I love when they take a house and they say, well, your problem is you're, you need organization. And they organize these people and they turn them loose with this new organized house. I said, give them six weeks. Because unless you've conditioned them how to be organized, in six weeks, it's going to look the same as the day you came into that place. The same with the people who have the facial makeovers and the hair and all that stuff. It won't take long because the, what's inside is what really matters. This is an amazing event, and Mark records this, how there was a man who was a wreck. His life was a wreck. It was what people say was hopeless. He lived in the tombs, mind you. He made his living in the graveyard. How many of you want to have your house where you want to live camping out in a graveyard? Now, when I was a kid, graveyards were scary places. Very scary places. I love this story that a pastor once told. I was at a pastor's conference. He told it on himself, and it was funny. He said, one of his first churches, the parsonage right behind the church, and behind that was this huge old cemetery. He had a little dog. He called Moses Joseph. Mojo was the nickname. And one dark, foggy night, the dog got out and ran in toward the cemetery. And his wife said, go get the dog. He's like, what, out there? So he's out in this dark, foggy cemetery hollering for his dog, Mojo, Mojo. Well, while he's out there, one of his deacons came by to see him. And his wife said, well, he's in the cemetery calling for the dog, but the dog's already home. So could you tell him that the dog is back? He said, oh, sure. Of course, the deacon had this thought go in his mind. So he's out, he starts walking into the cemetery and he hears the pastor, Mojo, are you out here? And the deacon goes, no, he's not. He said, and neither was I. <laughs> That's a scary place to be. And this man lived there. He said he cut himself with stones. It all said he was naked. He had been tried, they tried to bind him with chains and shackles. He broke them. That's strength. It was superhuman strength. Where did he get that? He was possessed. He was totally taken over by demonic activity in him, in his body. He had no more control over himself. He was super strong, super powerful, and scary. And as soon as Jesus and the disciples get off the boat, and they, did, they just been through a scary storm, and Jesus calmed the storm, they get off the boat, and what do they see? Freddy Krueger. I don't know about you. That's a big test of my faith. Uh, I better get back in the boat. Jesus, I think we, we got off at the wrong stop. <laughs> you know, let's go a little further up the hill. You know, let's go somewhere else. But Jesus knew this is where he needed to be. Because there was a human being that was wrecked and ruined by his life, by his sin, taken over by evil that needed saved. Do we see people out there right now that are wrecked and ruined? Their lives are just a total shipwreck. And what are we doing? Most of us would ignore them, walk the other way, cross the other side of the street. We wouldn't go anywhere near them because we recognize their life is a ruin. But Jesus says, this is why I came. For those wrecked and ruined lives, I want to restore them. I want to give them the transformation they need to be productive, to be everything that they were created to be. So in this, we're going to see how Jesus, the restorer of wrecked lives, can take from being dead to dignified to discipled. In fact, those are your three points. So if you want to take notes, they're your three points. Dead, dignified, and discipled. First of all, dead. Dead. This man was dead spiritually. 
He was in the tombs where the dead people are. That's why he lived there. He was identifying with the residents of the cemetery. Uh, when I was looking for a house, when we were first getting ready to move to Pulaski, I looked for a house, and one of the houses we looked at was right up against the cemetery up on the hill back here. And I'm like, well, at least the neighbors are quiet. I mean, he lived among the dead. Why? Because he was spiritually dead. He recognized he was spiritually dead. He was naked, covered in self-inflicted wounds. I imagined his hair stringy, long, wild eyes, ranting and raving. And it says he came running toward them. Now, again, I'm picturing this in my mind, this wild man, naked, strong. I mean, he might have still had a shackle hanging from one wrist. I don't know. And he's running and ranting and screaming. I'm ready to go the other way. But Jesus welcomed him. And the man even cried out, you are the son of the most high God. What have you to do with us? You see, Jesus was there to set someone free from death because Jesus is the author of life. And he wanted to correct this. He said, I'm the only hope he has. He's the only hope any of us have. Jesus is the only hope any of us have because all of us are born dead. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? We're all born dead. We're all born with that same dead spirit, the same spirit of sin that entraps us and holds us, and we can't escape it on our own. Satan has people bound every single day. There are evil spirits in our world today. Do you believe in demon possession? I've had people ask me that. Do you believe somebody can be demon-possessed today? I said, absolutely. I hear stories about it, even today. It doesn't make the news. It doesn't get, in, doesn't get in the magazines or the newspapers. But it happens. I have heard stories of people being possessed by evil spirits and having to be set free. Does that mean that everybody who has a mental illness has got an evil spirit? I'm not going to say that blanketly, but I'm going to say there's probably a large percentage that is, especially those that can't be explained. You know, there are some chemical imbalances. I get that. There are some people who have chemical imbalances, and they're, they kind of shift one, I mean, one minute they're excited and happy, next minute they're depressed and suicidal. You know, I get that. There is chemical imbalances. Fine. Find it, correct it, and they can live a normal, healthy, happy life. But there are those that it's not chemical, that they kind of add these titles and labels to it. We, we believe in psychology, the God of psychology, not the God of the universe. And there are demon possessions, there are evil spirits, and there are a lot of people right now being bound. And we walk away. We say they're a hopeless cause, they're a shipwrecked life. Jesus said, no, they're the reason I came. You're the reason I came. Because your life was like that too. Your life was just like that, and I came and redeemed you. I want to redeem them. I need you to be my messenger to bring us together, to do the introductions. That's what we're here to do. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 3, <clears throat> Paul says this, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And there are some people that, hear that, and they say, well, yeah, I was bad, but I wasn't quite that bad. Oh, really? You know, I heard a, a comedian once say that he was giving his testimony about he got into Satanism and got all this stuff, and he had one guy, come, a young man, come up to him and said, man, I was bad, but I wasn't as bad as you. And he looked at him and said, yeah, but we were going to go to the same hell. It didn't matter how bad you think you were. Sin is sin. Sin separates us from God. We're just as dead as that man in the tombs, as the people in the tombs. We're just as dead on the inside. 
Uh, I heard someone say it this way. If you were to go to any of our funeral homes around here, and you would go down to the embalming room, let's say they had two bodies there. One is a person who had just died a few hours ago in the hospital. The other one was a body found in the woods after a week. Now, I ask you, which is going to look better? Well, you say the one, obviously, you just died a few hours ago. But which one's more dead? Which one's more dead? It doesn't matter what they look like on the outside. They're still just as dead on the inside. And that's what Jesus came to do, resurrect that dead with life. Without Christ, we are all dead because Jesus is life. John 14, 6. Most of you probably could recite this one for me. Jesus said to him, that is Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes this claim, I am the life. Without Jesus, we have no life. So what can we do when we encounter someone who's dead on the inside? Introduce them to the author of life. Introduce them. Say, let me tell you about my Jesus, how he can take where you are right now and restore you to living, to life, to productivity. Oh, you just don't know the stuff I've done. You just don't know the life I've lived. You just don't know the people I hurt. No, I don't. Jesus does, but he still died for you. Jesus knows all about you, and yet he still gave his life for you. He gave up. His life, his body on that cross took the punishment. His blood was shed to cover all your failures. Not some of them. Not just the the little ones. To cover it all. His blood was shed to cover it all. And he can save to the uttermost. I love that. Covers it all. There is nothing too big, too deep, too dark, too horrible that Jesus' blood can't cover it. None. He is the one who restores life. And if that's describing anybody who's listening to this message, that your life, you feel like it's dead, there's no hope for me, I am a helpless wreck, no, you're not. If the Holy Spirit speaks to you, calls you by your name, because Jesus asked him, what is your name? Well, the man was so possessed by the devil, by his demons, he couldn't even tell him his name. The chief demon answered, we are legion. I can almost hear the the voice, because we are many. Well, how many were in this man? Well, there were 2,000 pigs that drowned. I said there was at least 2,000 demons in this man. That's pretty bad. That's pretty dead. That's pretty lost. And Jesus removed them all. What could he do for us when we feel dead? When we don't feel like there's any life in us, what could Jesus do? He can take it away and give us life. He is the author of life. So we go from dead to living, or dead to dignified. Point two, dignified. After he sends the evil spirits away, and I I can't even imagine the sound, okay? From what I've been hearing, description of where that region was around the uh, Sea of Galilee, that there was a very steep place, and the pigs were up on this plateau. And when the demons left this man, they entered those pigs, and the pigs suddenly being afflicted by these spirits that this man had been hurting himself, mind you. He's been cutting himself, tearing himself all to pieces. Well, now those same spirits are in these pigs, and they, screaming and squealing, go rushing down to the edge of basically a cliff and charging, all 2,000 of them charging down into the water. And in that raging water, you hear this screaming and squealing and sound, and then it suddenly starts to die down as these pigs drown. And then there's that eerie quiet afterward. And these servants who were taking care of the pigs saw that, experienced the fact that the disciples Standing there with Jesus, experience that sudden quiet as the demons drown the pigs. And then the servants go running out. They run back. They want to tell their, their boss what just happened because they're going to be held accountable. What happened to my pigs? You know? 
Let me tell you what happened to the pigs. And so I've, I've been told that the time it would have taken for those servants to hit those towns around there to talk to the people about what was going on was more than one day. Now, we don't see that. Mark doesn't really give us a time frame. But they say it would probably have taken at least a day, maybe two or three days, before all these people came to see what had just happened, what's going on. And by the time they get there, what do they find? They find the man sitting there at the feet of Jesus. He's no longer naked. He's clothed. He's no longer wild and raving. He's no longer hurting himself, but he's sitting there quietly listening to Jesus teach. He has become dignified. He's now clothed. He's now in his right mind. And people are like, what happened? How did you go from a raving madman to this? But he's sitting there listening to Jesus. He's sitting there listening to the author of life show him how he needs to live his life for God from now on. He's been given a new chance. He's been restored and transformed into this new person. And he's no longer a, a raving lunatic. Jesus had the authority to clothe him, to make him right. Isaiah 61.10 the prophet writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Can you imagine when you come to Christ and he transforms you, you're now clothed in his righteousness, clothed in his garments of praise. You are now covered. Before you were naked, now you're covered. And it's not your coverings, it's God's. You're now covered. God has taken it away and given you dignity that you didn't have before. Let's face it, running around naked is not dignified. Remember the days of streakers? Remember the days of streakers? People just suddenly shed all their clothes and run through a public place? I mean, you know, that was not no. I, I had a friend of mine actually did that in high school. He did that. Streaked through the school. He got caught. He got caught. And I can still hear his cheeks hit the floor to this day. He turned a corner, and there was a teacher around the corner, and he was in socks. He wasn't even wearing sneakers. He was in his stocking feet, and socks on a tile floor are not a good traction. He turned that corner, and his feet came out from under him, and his butt hit that floor. He got caught. And I said, that's not dignified. What possessed you to do that? The money. Well, how much did you get? $120. I went, I'm sorry, $120 to be naked running through a school is not enough. I mean, there's not enough gold in, at Fort Knox to have made, let me do something like that. But now he's covered. He is covered by Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. We come to Christ and he gives us a gift of the Holy Spirit. And we now have a new body. We have a new life. We have everything new for us. So it wouldn't make any sense to go back to the old way, right? It would, not, it would not make any sense to go back to being what we used to be like once we had an encounter with Jesus, the author of life. Just yesterday, I was mowing my yard, which I do frequently, especially with all the rain we've had. And it was a good day that we didn't have rain in the morning. So I get out. Now, for those who know about the size of property that I have, it's a, pretty, it's a double lot. It's a pretty good sizable property. And I've been having issues with my riding mower with cutting evenly, and I like my grass to be nice and even, and it was a little uneven. So for the last two months, I've been push mowing. 
because it makes the grass look better. I have a self-propelled, really nice push mower, and since I've lost some weight, I have more energy, and I don't mind. I really don't mind push mowing my yard. Uh, my watch tells me that I walk almost nine miles by the time I'm finished doing the trimming and everything else. I've walked about nine miles. But I come in the house, can you imagine what I look like? I am sweaty, head to toe. And, and of course, I have to shed my socks and shoes at the door. My wife will not let me bring any of that into the house on my feet. So I drop those off and carry my socks in, you know. Throw up. Would it make any sense for me to get in the shower Get all these sweaty clothes off, put them in the pile, get in the shower, take a nice hot shower, get out, and then put those clothes right back on. Would that make any sense to anybody? You'd think I was a raving lunatic to do that, right? So why is it when some people come to Jesus, they want the healing, they want the help, they want the restoration, and yet they barely get dry out of the baptistry and they're back into the old way, the old way of living, the old life that let them to sin in the first place. I'm like, that makes no sense to me. When you had an encounter with Jesus, you're going to have a new mind, a new mindset. I want to be more like him and less like me. So I want to shed the old me. I want the new. I want what Jesus has for me. So he cleans us up, gives us life, and what do we do with it? We're to live that life for him. Because we're now dignified, we're clothed in his righteousness. And if we're in his righteousness representing Jesus, we need to look more like Jesus, right? So how do we get to look more like Jesus? We have to go through a process called discipleship, which brings us to point number three. See how fast we did that. Discipled. It said, when these people from these surrounding villages and towns came and they found him clothed in his right mind, they did something which would have been kind of unusual, I thought, anyway. Every time I read this, I think, how unusual. They looked at Jesus, and instead of saying, well, thank you so much for helping this man. We've tried. We, we couldn't bind him. We couldn't do anything for him. Thank you. No. What did they say? Jesus, could you go somewhere else? Jesus, could you leave our area? We, we, we don't want you here. What in the world reaction is that? But that's what they did. They said, we don't want you here. Go. Go somewhere else. So Jesus, being the gentleman that he was, he came and did what he came there for, and that was for that man whose life was totally wrecked and ruined. Jesus said, okay, fine, we'll leave. And they're getting in the boat. This man who had just been healed from the possession, he comes to Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to be with you. I want to keep learning. For the last however many hours it was, I'm sitting at your feet. I learned so much from you. I want to continue. I want to go with you. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You have an important job to do. I'm commissioning you to go back and tell everybody what just happened. Your job is to go and to tell. I've already discipled you. I've given you all you need to know. I have prepared you for what you need to do. Now go and tell. Does this sound familiar to anybody? You are now commissioned to go and tell. I've discipled you, trained you, prepared you. Tell your story. Go back to the people that knew you. Present yourself to them. You're not the same person they knew. You're a totally, radically new being. You're not hurting yourself. You're not screaming like a lunatic. You're not breaking chains. you got clothes on. Probably even got a haircut. I don't know. You are a totally new person. And these people are not going to recognize you. They're not going to know who you are. You've got to remind them who you are. But I want you to go back and tell them exactly what God has done for you. I find it interesting because prior to this, Jesus had demoniacs coming to him, crying out, you're the son of God. He said, be quiet and get out. And people got healed of different diseases. They said, don't tell anybody about it. And they told everybody, here's a man he's telling, I want you to go tell. Why? The region, the Decapolis, the ten towns, that's what it means, the ten cities or ten towns, had a lot of Gentiles there. In fact, this man possessed of these demons may not have been Jewish. He might have been a Gentile himself. Go back and tell them what God just did for you. They knew you. 
They knew the life you lived. They knew the person you'd become. And now they're going to see this changed life. How did that change happen? Jesus, I had an encounter with Jesus, the author of life, and he's given me a new life. He could, do, could he do the same for you? Could he do the same for you? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we all know this one, the Great Commission. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, stay. Oh, that does say go, doesn't it? Go and make disciples of the people who like you. All the nations, oh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. Now, there is a second great commission. Maybe you didn't know that. There's a second great commission found in the book of Acts, one of my, another one of my favorite passages, Acts Chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, he replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But, there's a big conjunction, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Suggesting. Oh, telling. So you don't do it silently just with your lifestyle? Well, I want my lifestyle to be my witness. I'm not going to frighten people. I'm not going to force people. I'm not going to confront people. Let my lifestyle. Is that what it says? Telling people about what? Me. And just do it in a local place, right in your own house, right? Everywhere. Well, where is everywhere, Jesus? Well, he gives you in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, wait, Samaria, we don't deal with Samaritans, and to the ends of the earth. Wait, wait, Jesus, that's where the Gentiles are. That's where the Romans are. The Greeks, wait, 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 huh? The Second Great Commission, where to go and where to tell. Why? Because that's what Jesus requires of us. If, if a fireman sees a house on fire, and he stands there on the street and goes, well, it'll burn out by itself. Okay, that's a true statement, but what is his job? If a police officer sees a bunch of juveniles defacing your house, vandalizing your home, stealing your possessions, and he stands there on the corner and says, well, boys will be boys. Okay, um, what is your opinion of that police officer? Or a doctor. You've gone to the doctor, you've been feeling really bad, and he runs all these tests. He looks at the test results, and he sees that you have a very serious, very serious condition. But he looks at you and says, well, just take two aspirin and call me in the morning. In those three cases, what are your thoughts about those three people? Not very good. You're not doing your job. You're not taking your job seriously your job, your duty is to provide and protect, right? Provide the service of putting out the fire. Protect my property and, and all that stuff. And to tell me the truth about my condition so that it could be fixed if it can be fixed. Have we not been commissioned by Jesus and our duty is to go and tell? Ouch. Oops. Where to go and tell? Jesus said, I have restored you. Your life was a wreck. You were dead. You were just dead bodies inside you. You were dead, and I gave you life. I have clothed you in my righteousness, not yours, because your righteousness are like filthy rags. You're clothed in my righteousness. I want you to look and act like me. So learn from me. Study my word. Learn how it is to look like me and act like me and talk like me. Then go tell. What are you going to tell them? Your story. Tell them your life, how you were ruined. You were like that man filled with 2,000 demons 
that was now restored. Your mind is correct. You're clothed. Everything is now in balance. Why? Because you encountered Jesus. Tell them your story. You don't have to have deep theology. You don't have to study a, a theology book. And I got some theology books. One of, my, one of my favorites is Erickson. It's a big, thick, green book. We called it the Big Green Anchor. When we're carrying it to class, we had all walking like this. It was so big. That's a deep book about everything you'd ever want to know about systematic theology. You don't have to know that. All you have to know is I had a meeting with Jesus, and I'm different now, and this is how it happened. You tell people your story. Each one of us have a story. It's going to be different from the other person. That's okay, because somewhere out there is someone in the same condition you once were in. Somewhere out there is someone who is living a life that is wrecked and ruined. They're drug-soaked, alcohol-soaked. They're caught up in all kinds of bad things, evil things, and not just in those addictive things, but there's, there are shopaholics. There are workaholics. There are all kinds of other aholics. People who are caught up in bad relationships over and over and over. They're in these cycles of relationships where they're getting beat up, torn down, ripped apart. Why? Because they need to encounter the, the Jesus who says, that's not who you are. That's not who you need to be. You are mine. Your identity is not in what you've been doing or who you've been with. Your identity is in me. Changed from the inside out, transformed and made new, covered in his righteousness. Then go and tell. Tell the story of what Jesus did for you. That's all we got to do. And then let Jesus do the work. Let the Holy Spirit convict the person of their need for Jesus to clean them up, to bring them to life. Because the Holy Spirit's the only thing to take their dead spirit and give it life. It's the only, only the Holy Spirit can do that. We can't. But we introduce them. We do the introductions and let the Holy Spirit do his work. It may not happen immediately, but someday down the road, they're going to remember that encounter. And they're going to give their life to Jesus. And you had a part in it. And that's all he asks us to do. Go tell. There are so many shipwrecked lives that people look at and say, you're hopeless. You're, there's no way anybody could fix this. No, Jesus can. And that's our job. Introduce them to Jesus. Are you ready, church, to be the church on mission with the commission with Jesus? To go and tell. You don't have to study theology. Go and tell your story. They'll, the, the evil is overcome by the blood of Christ and the word of our testimony. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for what you've already done in my life and what you want to do. There's so much more. You're working in me. You're showing me things. And I'm not there yet. None of us are. But there is someone out there who maybe are watching this live or maybe they're seeing it later on a, re, a restreaming. That their life is like that man. They're, they're dead inside. Their life is a ruin. They're covered in sores from the way life has beat them up or they beat themselves up and right now they're crying out for help they don't know how to find help or where to go but their spirit needs your holy spirit to awaken them and maybe that's happening right now they're waking up for the first time and understanding that you love them in spite of their failures in spite of the life they've been living you love them and you want to restore them you are the restorer of wrecked lives. And maybe now your spirit is breathing across their dead spirit and awakening it. Bringing them out of the tombs to come and understand that you are the son of the most high God. And that you're here to set the captives free. To release us from the bondage of sin, shame, of a life that was lived for self. And right now, there is a need to release that to you. To pray a simple prayer of surrender. Say, God, forgive me a sinner. I have ruined my life. I have done things that were wrong. 
And right now, I come to you, Jesus, the only hope, my only hope. I've tried other ways, and they're not working. I need you. Jesus, you are the Son of God. Jesus, you paid the price I deserved, and I want to surrender everything, all of the ashes and, and chaos of my life. I surrender it to you. Take it and make something new out of it. Make something beautiful out of it. For only you can. I believe in you, Jesus. If anyone has prayed that prayer, Father, that they are now a new creature in Christ. The breath of the Holy Spirit has breathed on them, and they're now new. They can feel it. There's a change. They feel hope for the first time, perhaps in years or ever. There's a hope now. And so help them as they feel this new energy of life that they would contact this church to let us know. They would contact us, put comments in the section, contact us in any way they can so we can celebrate, first of all, celebrate this new life they found. And then we can get them materials of what to do next. What's the next step? How do we go through discipleship? And then connect them with a church, a local church to where they live that they can learn and grow to be more like Jesus. To learn to put on this new clothing of righteousness that you're providing and live more for you and less for self. It's a process. It's not overnight. It's not instantaneous, but we can help them. For the rest of us, forgive us for we have not fulfilled the commission you've called us to. And that great commission wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't a, if you get around to it, it was a command that we're to go, we're to tell. Tell our story. Tell everything you taught us. And all of those lessons you put on us, we can teach it to someone else who might need to hear that. The results are not up to us. The results are up to the Holy Spirit. But you do hold us responsible. It is our duty as a fireman, police officer, or a doctor. It is our duty to go and tell, to do what you've commissioned us to do. Share our stories with people around us because they need to know. They need to hear it. And who knows? There may be a demoniac right now in our community that needs to know that you're there and want to deliver them from that possession because you want to possess them from the inside out. Jesus, we've entered here to worship let us depart to serve. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we go to our closing invitation?
Father, as we leave this sanctuary, let us go out where the people are hurting, dying, and show them, introduce them to Jesus, the author of life. We have truly entered here to worship, and we want to depart to serve, to be your hands, your feet, and your voice. These things we ask in your precious name. Amen.